Hello, my name is Livia Katsini and I am a PhD student at Kagi Leuven Biotech Plus. My presentation is titled Forecasting Cow Milk Microbial Safety and Quality Attributes Based on Climate Dynamics. A quick overview of, this, of the presentation today. First, a short introduction on climate change, impact modeling and the objective of this work. Then, uh, I will talk about the methods, the data sets and the data pretreatment steps. And then, the results when it comes to farms variability, correlation analysis, the predictive models and the forecasting models. Finally, some conclusions. So, climate change is already here. As we can see on the graph, Belgium is already experiencing an increase in temperature. And this increase is expected to continue under all climate change mitigation scenarios. This means that it is very important to quantify the effects of climate change on the affected sectors, this means also the food sector. In our latest publication, we present the framework in order to conduct these uh, impact assessments in a quantitative way. This means that we are using climate models that are accounting for climate mitigation scenarios and are giving us the climate projections. Then, by using impact models, we are considering these climate projections and we are getting the quantified risks. These risks are then <coughs> propagated along the farm to fork continuum in order to have a holistic assessment. The objective of this work is to build an impact model that is accounting for cow milk production and specifically for yield, milk composition and the microbiological state of milk. This means that we are accounting for food security, food quality and food safety aspects. These are the data sets that we are using in order to build these impact models. On the one side, we have the bulk milk dataset. This dataset is originating from Malta. It is accounting for five years and it is originating from, for mo from more than 120 farms. It is co containing, vo containing volume, fat content, protein content, lactose content, somatic cell counts and total aerobic mesophilic flora referred to as, from now on, microbial load. On the other hand, we have the climate data set, that is, it is referring to the same time period, and it, ha it is consisting of temperature variables, precipitation, wind speed, vapor pressure, relative humidity, radiation, and several uh, temperature, humidity, uh, temperature humidity index, calculated through several different formulas. Concerning the methods that we are going to apply, we are going to use wavelet transformation in order to denoise the data. From the unsupervised uh, learning methods, we are going to use principal component analysis and the thin distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. From the supervised learning options, we are going to use partial least squares regression, and we're going to use a, an, an adapted version of the PLS model that is accounting for autoregression. When it comes to the data preprocessing steps, we start from screening the farms based on the sample completeness. As we can see on the graph, each dot is representing one farm. And not all farms were accounting for all the five years time span. So we sampled the farms and we ended up with the ones that were uh, containing data from all the five years. Then we had to resample the data because not every farm had the same sampling frequency. This, mean, this means that uh, some farms were sampled weekly, some other farms daily and some other farms every eight days. The best uh, uh, the best uh, sampling frequency that we uh, ended up was weekly. And the same thing 
uh, we, we, some recently the climate data as well uh, because they were uh, originally daily values then end, ended up in weekly values for the climate data as well. Due to this resampling, uh, we ended up with gaps in our data set and we had to fill in these gaps. So in the graph here you can see volume over time for one uh, example farm and as red you can see the data points that were missing it was the gaps and that we filled in uh, and we filled in uh, as apart from this we removed also the outliers that you can see here here and here afterwards we applied denoising on the data by applying wavelet transformation. On this graph, you can see the original data uh, represented from an example variable fat. So the green lines represent the farm's data, the red line is the mean trajectory, and the blue lines represent the mean trajectory plus minus one standard deviation. And this is the result after applying the wavelet transformation. As we can see, we get a smoother lines. Afterwards, we had to transform the skewed distributions in order to get, no, to get normal distributions. One example is the somatic cell counts, for which we applied the logarithmic transformation. When it comes to the microbial load, we had to follow a different strategy. This strategy was to apply a score transformation. This is the original data set. Again, each line is represented, uh, each uh, gray line is representing one farm over time. The red line is the mean trajectory, and the blue lines are the mean trajectory plus minus one standard deviation. This is the result after applying a score transformation. This means that we assign the score to each data point. And as you can see, the data were quite noisy as well. So then we applied a moving window weighted sum in order to get more smooth data. And this is the final result. Moving forward to the results, first I'm, I'm going to talk about the farm's clustering and uh, how we managed to deal with the farm variability when it comes to microbial load. For this, for this we applied the TSNE, which is a non-linear uh, non dimensionality reduction strategy uh, that is um, highlighting the similarities between the data points. So here we can see each dot being re representing one farm. And uh, as we can see, we have one, two, and three clusters of farms. Uh, the dots are colored based on the average microbial load count. And as we can see, they are clustered based on this value, which means that we have three different um, clusters of farm hygiene levels as microbial load is a representative variable for farm hygiene. And then we analyzed the farms based on these groups in order to have better interpretable results. This led to the correlation analysis that we try to correlate a the milk data and also find correlations between the milk data and the climate data. We applied principal component analysis on the milk data set. Here we can see the contribution of the original variables to the first three latent variables arriving uh, from the principal component analysis. As we can see, fat and protein seem to be correlated somatic cell counts with microbial load and volume, and also volume with lactose. Here we can see the covariance matrix. 
Again, fat and protein seem to have a positive correlation. Microbial load and volume, a negative correlation. Microbial load and fat, again a negative correlation. And microbial load and somatic cell counts, a positive correlation. In this way, we managed to limit the uh, problems we had in due to farm variability and get interpretable results, which is demonstrated the, demonstrating the added value of clustering. Here we can see the covariance matrix of the milk variables and the climate variables. As we can see, somatic cell counts and microbial load, which is a microbial safety um, related variables, seem to have a positive correlation with all the temperature related climate variables. Also, a negative correlation with wind speed and microbial load has a negative correlation with precipitation and wind speed. Moving on to the results of the predicted models. The aim was to use the climate data in order to predict the milk data. For this, we developed partial, partial least squares models. This is the result of the volume. As we can see on the response plot, the relationship between the predicted value and the true value is quite good. The model is formed for, from four latent variables and it is explaining 68% of the variation of the data. On this graph, we can see the data over time. As the data, the data is depicted as the dots, and the line is, uh, uh, is showing us the approximation of the model. As you can see, the model is performing well when it comes to seasonality, and also when it comes to mid-range values. However, when we have extreme values here and here, the model is not performing that good. Here are the results for fat. Again, we have a, a good uh, performance when it comes to mid values, but when it comes to low values, the performance is, the, is not that good. This model is uh, formed by two latent variables and it is explaining 70% of the variation of the data. Again, here we see that the model is performing well when it comes to mid range values and it is capturing the seasonality of the data set. However, when it comes to extreme values, it is not performing that good. Here are the results of the microbial load variable, a partial least squares regression model. As we can see, mid-range values, uh, for mid-range values, it is performing well. But for uh, extreme values, it is not performing that good. We have bigger errors. This is also demonstrated in this graph, where a seasonality is captured. However, when it comes to extreme values, the model is not performing good. This is why we uh, decided to move on into a forecasting model, which will take into account also the history of the milk data. And here are the results of the forecasting models. So in order to do that, we developed a partial least squares to regression model. This, this means that for predicting the milk data, apart from the climate data, we are also using the history of the milk data as predictors. This is the scheme that we used. So in order to predict one week, we used the data of the, the climate data of the same week and the history of four weeks up, up to four weeks before um, of the milk variable. And this is the result when it comes to microbial load. As we can see, the model is performing quite well for all range values and it is formed of four latent variables. Here we can see the training set here and the validation set here. The model is performing really well. However, we have a short forecast horizon. This means that we can predict only one week 
by accounting for the for previous weeks. And uh, in order to obtain a bigger forecast horizon, for example, in four weeks, the strategy should be a more time series uh, dedicated one. Here we have the results for the somatic cell counts, which is also a microbial food safety aspect and variable. Again, the results are pretty good, both for training data and validation data. And here we can see that this variable had more uh, outliers, which means that we have to improve the data preprocessing steps for this specific variable. And we have again the problem of the short forecast horizon, which can be solved with time series uh, applications. Finally, some conclusions. We proposed an impact modeling framework to assess the effect of climate change on microbial food safety. This can be used also for other aspects, for example, for spoiled microorganisms and other risk, fa risk factors. Secondly, based on our correlation analysis, microbial load and somatic cell counts, which are variables that are related with uh, microbi the microbiological state of raw milk have a positive re relationship with temperature-related variables and a negative relationship with wind speed. We uh, managed to build PLS regression models that are accounting for climate variables and are able to predict volume and fat content uh, that are performing well for mid-range values. Finally, our work on the PLS autoregression models is demonstrating the potential use of them in order to forecast microbial food safety aspects that are accounting microbial load and somatic cell counts. Thank you very much for your attention and I am willing to answer any questions.